Today, we gather as an online community, united by one voice, to worship and praise our Lord and Saviour. Good morning. It's good to be back at, at Highlands. Um, I was a little bit amused when I got a, a WhatsApp asking me to preach because uh, I was asked to preach on discipleship. And I thought, well, I've preached on this at Highlands before, but I guess hopefully um, there's something that needs to be heard again. And so I'm afraid if you're bored or if it's uh, something you already know, well, well done you. And when I was asked to speak about discipleship, I thought, and on some of the ways that Jesus taught about discipleship and how to live uh, uh, our faith out in relationship to the Father, and I thought, my goodness, that's a ridiculously a ridiculous topic. It's so big. It's like, um, could you talk about marriage, or could you talk about how to be healthy. It's like, how long do we have? Because it's one of those subjects that uh, you actually never arrive, and if you think you have arrived, you're probably in trouble. Most people, I've never been married. Most people who have been married will say, no, you never get there. All you have to remember is two little words as a man, and those two little words are, yes, dear. You, we all have to, marriage is something that goes on and on and on, and you're learning every day, and it's new every day. And the same thing applies to keeping healthy. You can be, a lot of people start diets and start being healthy and start exercising, and they last a few months, and they degenerate, and they go back again. <clears throat> but you know, discipleship, is something so important. It's something that we are called to be. And, you know, I was thinking a lot about what is a disciple? What makes up being a disciple? And a disciple is someone who learns from somebody else, sees what they do, and tries to emulate them, tries to do the same thing. And Jewish rabbis, we think of disciples because we're thinking about Jesus. But there had been disciples for years and years and years. All the rabbis in Palestine had disciples. People who lived with them, men who lived with them, ate with them, studied with them, discussed things with them. John the Baptist had disciples, people who were with him. Paul, later on, he was a disciple of the Jewish rabbi Gamaliel. And Jesus' disciples were, quite honestly, a mixed bunch of men and women who traveled with him. He ate with them, he prayed with them, he taught them, and he discussed all manner of issues with him. They saw him healing people, they saw him walking on the water, they saw him casting out demons, they saw him feeding the 5,000, they saw him in arguments with people, and they heard him preach and teach. And you know, the key thing was they spent three years with Jesus. And I have to say, they, he sent them out to do stuff. And they did some amazing things. 
But they also made some big mistakes. And one of them betrayed them, and Peter, of course, denied him. And I would say then, you know, the man who never made a mistake never made anything. How many of you have never made a mistake? They also say the man who never learned from his mistakes never learned anything. And you know, discipleship for any of us involves learning how to do something differently. You know, I remember, I'm very thankful that Michael Suddens isn't here today, but I remember when I was... Uh, doing obstetrics, and um, it was during the Rhodesian War, it was a nightmare time, and we were short of doctors, and the day I started obstetrics, because we were so short of registrars, I was made an acting registrar, and our consultant, this lady consultant said, you're going to be on on your own tonight. Let me teach you how to do a cesarean section. <laughs> so she took me off, and we did a cesarean section together. And of course, that night, I had to do one on my own. And all I can say is thank God for the nursing sisters, because those theatre nursing sisters talked me through my first cesarean section. I went and checked the patient the next day, and I couldn't believe that she was still alive. <laughs> and about three weeks later, there was a delightful consultant, uh, Ian Brown, who was the professor. And I went to him and I said, you know what? I have now done 20 cesarean sections, but I'm sure I'm doing a whole lot of things wrong please, will you come and do one with me? And he came and he did a couple. We did a whole list together. And it was so important that I learned what I was doing wrong. And we all need people who guide us through doing stuff. You know, and I have to say, we are all making disciples. I remember a very good friend of mine who was a pastor, and the one day he was doing, as we always do in uh, Harare, he was driving down the traffic, and it wasn't as bad as it is now, but it was still pretty bad. And this car cut in on him. And his son, who was four years old, said, look at that guy, what a chop, what does he think he's doing? And this friend of mine was saying, stop saying those words. And then he says, but you do it, Dad. <laughs> and you know, that's the truth, is that more of discipleship is caught than is taught. You know, how many of you would say to your kids, no, 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 no. You must never tell a lie. No, 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 don't tell a lie. And then the Jehovah's Witnesses arrive at your door and they knock there and you see them and you say to your son, tell them I'm not at home. <laughs> okay, so what was that bit about not lying? And what is that kid picking up? It's like, well, you tell the truth when you want to tell the truth, but when it's expedient, it's, it's fine to lie. And I have to say that we are all guilty of a mixed life. But, you know, to be a disciple means that we are seeking to live like our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I often wonder, 
if I truly am but trying to be like Jesus, because when Jesus calls us, it's not what a lot of evangelism about is about. A lot of evangelism that we create is about saying a prayer, confessing your sins, and believing in Jesus Christ. And I remember Dire Straits 30 years ago, they sang a song, and it was called, I've Got My Ticket to Heaven. And I think we need to realize Jesus doesn't call us to tickets to heaven. He calls us to discipleship, to following him. One of my heroes, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who was executed by Hitler two or three weeks before the end of the Second World War, he said, when Jesus calls a man to him, he bids him come and die. We are called to pick up our cross daily and follow him. And discipleship is not about you fulfilling your earthly desires. It's about you and me focusing on the life, the word, the calling of Jesus Christ and seeking to become more like him. And it's costly. And we need, all of us, to be seeking to be disciples. First of all, to be disciples of Jesus Christ, and then to be making disciples. The Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1, he says, Follow me, imitate me, as I imitate Jesus Christ. And so the first thing all of us need to do is to be fixing our eyes upon our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. I think there are a whole lot of things we need to do. We need to start praying for ourselves. I would confess that there are many times that when I have failed so badly as a disciple of Jesus Christ, and we need to be praying, Lord, speak to me and draw me to yourself that I might be more like Jesus. The prayer of John the Baptist comes to my mind. John the Baptist said, He must increase and I must decrease. And that's really what we are called to be. It's that Jesus might take over more and more of my life. And I pray that that might be true for you and for me. We also, one of the keys is studying this word. You know, I meet many Christians who hardly ever open their Bible, don't read it, and certainly don't treat it as though it has any authority. We need to be reading this word. We also need to be giving. Giving sacrificially, like we were talking about here, and I sort of think, I hope you guys are going to be flooded in milk and Milo and Horlicks and biscuits and, and everything else. 
Because, you know, it's a sad thing. That so much of our lives is taken up with things that are actually not that relevant. And the most important thing is that we might show Jesus Christ. And I have to tell you, all of you are making disciples of people every day. As I said with that little kid being told to lie, your kids pick up your character. They do. I don't care. It doesn't matter. Your workmates, the ethos of a company is picked up by the, from the MD. If the head of the company says, do it like this, that will trickle down into the whole company. If kids see mom and dad lying, they will do the same thing. You know, I often hear people complain. You know, the kids of today. And I think, well, who raised the kids of today? It was the adults of today who raised them. So... We need to look at ourselves. A number of years ago, I was taking a group of youngsters around Zimbabwe. All of them were delightful young Christian men. And of course, we got stopped near Chivu. And the police were, gave me a hard time about my jolly fire extinguisher, which was fine. And I have to tell you, I got into a huge argument with the policeman. And at the end of it, I turned to him and I said, I ended up having to pay him this money. And I said to him, I just hope you don't get sick because I'm a doctor. And if you come to me, I am not going to look after you. And then I drove off. And about 10 k's around the road, I had to apologize to those guys and say, guys, you just saw the worst display of Christian character, and I'm so sorry. And you can all relate to it. And God's not looking for, and you know, as parents, you're not perfect, but they are looking for men and women who genuinely display the character of Jesus. And you know, we've all got a character. We've all got a character. And I wonder, because the Bible talks about how we are the fragrance of Christ. And I've certainly been in the room I've got some friends who, whenever they seem to walk into the room, you sense goodness. I've also got friends who's the exact opposite. The minute they arrive, you think, oh, I think I'm leaving this party. And I wonder if, if I am the sort of peer person that people want to be around, do I demonstrate that I am a disciple of Christ? Because, you know, the word Christian actually means a little Christ. A little Christ. A disciple of Jesus. And I wonder... If people look at me and say, I didn't so much see Ken Jenkins, but I saw the God that he serves. And I wonder if that's true of you. And so I want to encourage you. I really do want to encourage you today. To step out. Don't be satisfied with your status quo. 
I can't be satisfied with myself because I fall so short of being the disciple that Jesus wants me to be. And I would encourage you to start praying, start reading this word, meet with people who are going to encourage you in your walk. And it doesn't matter. It's not dependent on how intelligent you are. You know, we just read that little passage about the calling of those disciples. The book of Mark is almost certainly Peter's story. But it was written by Mark because Peter was illiterate. And yet Jesus called Peter and Andrew, James and John, who were probably all illiterate fishermen. And he made them into his first disciples. It's not dependent about, upon how intelligent you are, how powerful you are, how rich you are, or poor you are. It's dependent on you walking with Jesus. It's dependent on me walking with Jesus. And I want to encourage you to allow the Spirit of God to work in your life And you know what? I remember when I was part of another church years ago and there was this one man there and he just said at one of our meetings, he said, it's tough. That's just the way I am. I'm a grumpy old man. And I thought, you know, that's not acceptable. That's not acceptable. I don't have to be a grumpy old man. I don't have to be jealous or proud or angry. If I'm doing that, I'm blaming my past. But I can move forwards to be a disciple of Jesus and to demonstrate the fruit of the Spirit. And I want to encourage you. This is not an easy word. And I can tell you it's not easy for me. That I want, by prayer, by reading God's word, by fellowship with people, by giving and giving beyond my ability to give, by praying for those who are sick, by reaching out to the poor. When we were talking about Stanford going to the prisons, Jesus says, when did you visit me? When you were in prison. We've all got a call to do stuff. We come across people all through the day, every day, who need encouragement, who need prayer. And if we're going to show Jesus to this world... We need to simply not just be converts, but disciples of Jesus. And ultimately, it's all about him. I'm very aware I turned 70 this year, and my three score years and ten are up. And then... When I die, it's not going to matter what I owned. What's all that's going to matter is what Jesus says when I die. And I've always said, you know, funerals are actually pretty irrelevant. Because what people say about you doesn't really matter that much. 
You know what matters? It's what Jesus says to you when you see him. And my prayer for myself and my prayer for each one of you is that Jesus might say, Well done, my good and faithful servant. Enter into the rest prepared for you. And so, guys, don't be satisfied with where you are. Don't be satisfied with where you are. Seek to follow Jesus, and you'll find out about that through reading this word. Pray that you might be changed. And in many ways, this word acts as a mirror to reveal the areas where we need to change. And ask other people. Sometimes it's hard. Like that little kid saying, but you do that, Dad. Hmm? The apple doesn't fall far from the tree. And maybe we need to ask our workmates, you know, do your workmates see something of Jesus in you? Do they ever hear you talk about Jesus? Do you ever say, when they ask what you did this weekend, do you ever say, no, I went to church? Hmm, are you religious or something? Yes, I am more than religious, I'm a Christian. Do you want to hear about it? Or are you embarrassed? So we're called, guys, and we're not called to a ticket to heaven. And we're also not called to have the focus on me. This world does not revolve around you. It does not revolve around me. It revolves around our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I want to encourage you. I don't want this to be a discouraging message. There's no greater joy. There's no greater fulfillment than being a disciple of Jesus Christ. I just looked at Dietrich Bonhoeffer's book again this morning. And I thought, he died in 1945, executed by Hitler. He was engaged to get married, and he died. But he's absent from the body and present with the Lord. I think of Jim Elliot, who was massacred in the 1950s in Central America, and he said, He is no fool who gives what he cannot hold to gain what he cannot lose. What a testimony and what a challenge to all of us. Guys, I pray that I truly might be a disciple of Jesus. And as I said, if I think I am, I'm there already, then I've probably got it wrong. Because we all need to keep on going. Keep on going. And go deeper into his word, deeper into prayer, and deeper into fellowship with God and with one another. Let's pray. Father, we thank you and praise you for these words that Jesus spoke. And I pray that you might make each one of us, that we might become disciples and continue as disciples and continue as disciples and continue. And that you might say to us on that day, well done my good and faithful servant. Enable us to do that, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen.
We pray that you would have a great week knowing that God your Father is with you every step of the way.